thank you for this opportunity to speak here. Um, my presentation is Going with the Flow from Sediment Cores Underwater to 3D Stratigraphic Models in ArcGIS to Site Management. Uh, since the 60s, experts have been conducting underwater research in the lakes of Zurich uh, on the pile dwellings and they have uh, nearly 60 years of research of course accumulated a lot of data. In the next 15 minutes I would like to uh, present the different types of data and models that we use in our site management. As you will see there are 3D descriptive stratigraphic models, episodic lake bottom surface models, um, predictive hydraulic models, post-dictive ge geotechnical models, and uh, hypothetic geo geochemical models, and uh, you see too many ideas for the future. Sadly, Niels Bleicher, the co-author, is not could not be here. He is the dendrochronologist and uh, project manager of the last big excavation that we conducted in Zurich. Um, so I have to take his place. I have been uh, working as an underwater archaeologist for the department since seven years. So um, I have been conducting most of the data uh, accumulation and I've also uh, generated the 3D models and the automated process to create them. First, a bit uh, overview, what are we studying? Uh, the pile dwelling phenomenon, phenomenon can be found on nearly all alpine lakes surrounding the Alps, especially France, Switzerland, Italy and Germany, also Slovenia and Austria, whereby most of the sites lie on the shores of the Swiss lakes. Surrounding Lake Zurich, we can record over 100 of those pile dwellings. In 2011, 111 of those sites were selected as a UNESCO World Heritage. Uh, in the canton of Zurich, seven of these were included. Which is quite interesting because it's one of the only UNESCO World Heritage that nobody can see. So it's a hidden, uh, sunken and forgotten parts that we are trying to uh, present again. The pile dwelling sites are one of the most important archaeological sources for the study of early agrarian societies in Europe between 5,500. In Switzerland it's 4,200 to 800, but it's just another one. The waterlogged conditions have preserved uh, organic matter that contributes in an outstanding way to our understanding of significant changes in the Neolithic and Bronze Age. The site not only offers excellent preservation of plant remains, which produce detailed information on the ecological surroundings and the economy, but also allow us rare insight into the lives of these early agrarian societies. Even the tools, as you can see, remain in an exquisite state. One of the most uh, important organic matter preserved, of course, is the wood, especially the piles. These piles are remnants of the former platforms or houses. In the excavation of Zurich Opera, the last big one we conducted, uh, we documented over 16,000 of these piles. Um, of course, this means it's a good toll house for every dendrochronologist out there. <laughs> these piles, of course, don't belong to one phase. Um, it's, uh, they are part of a grand local stratigraphy. Here is an impression of the deposits in the Zurich Opera. Uh, we, uh, the bright sediment consists of natural calcareous lake marl, whereas the dark layers pre represent the anthropogenic waterlogged organic cultural deposits. To document and protect these sites is the main task of our department. We monitor all sites and identify those threatened by erosion. Building on that, we try to identify what is causing the erosion. Wind-induced waves, ship-induced waves, swimmers, private yacht anchors. Uh, the question is always where to invest our limited resources. <coughs> to achieve a holistic inventory of all sites, um, we have used different methods for site analysis and modeling. I will use the example of a site in Zurich to show you what our holistic inventory contains. 
as you can see, a holistic inventory should, of course, include all archaeological information, uh, settlement context, the site management information, and it's, it can all be um, split up into two groups. We have the dynamical data that we are most of them have to be modeled, and the static data, which of, uh, which is the, the, the stuff that's still there in the grounds that we are trying to study. So first, we need to know what is still around and where. Else put, we need an approximative 3D model of the cultural deposits at and under the lake's bottom surface. Minimal invasive methods include two kinds of core sampling that we produce, uh, open probe and dry ice probes. The open probes have a fixed length of 1 meter 50, while the dry ice probes can go as deep as 4 meters with a tripod and 8 meters with an excavator. These give us local stratigraphy and can also be used to acquire C14 probes. We enter these stratigraphical point data into a database and feed them in a GIS system. With the correct data model and just a few Python lines, we can automatically, automatically construct a digital 3D model of all individual coring results. They form the basis of our uh, descriptive stratigraphic model. Honestly though, um, especially when you see the, uh, in the interpolation, uh, this is mostly um, um, descriptive, it's mostly uh, interpolation because the taphonomic processes are a little more complicated. But it still helps us to figure out where to start. The next step is to construct a surface model. We use the core results for this, and sometimes we add remote controlled sonar data. They have a higher information density, but less information on the actual sediment. Here we are uh, experimenting with an autopilot fish feeder uh, and a fish finder. So. <laughs> a third method is the surface surveying. Here, an area specified as endangered is freed from mud. The artifacts are collected per square meter, uh, and all the piles are measured with an underwater GPS, and a sample is cut from each pile. Since it, since it is hot right now, we also create SFM models if, if we need them or if it helps. Um, at this point, we have some stratigraphic point data and a denser point cloud of the surface, of the lake surface. Now we need to know where has the most erosion taken place and where will the most erosion take place. The traditional method for the first question uh, are the erosion controls. Here a fixed installation on the water is used to measure periodically if erosion has occurred. These installations uh, include modern piles, historic piles, or to get a surface profile, um, a set of piles between which a line and a tape line can be fixed, allowing a measurement from the line to the lake bed. We are, we are working on a method to determine erosion through uh, repeated episodic measuring with the button boat, as I said before. Comparing the results should give us information on accumulation or erosion. However, this is still a work in progress and uh, not very uh, detailed. Now we have a stratigraphic model and a surface model. To get to an analytic predictive model, we can add measure measurements of the hydrodynamical exposition of the site. Here, wave patterns, current speeds, uh, particle <laughs> concentration, particle accumulation and more is measured. Combining these dynamic data with our static data allows us to predict certain aspects of the site. For this site, uh, Hurten Seefeld, the combination of our interpolated cultural layers and the hydrodynamic measurements reveal the greatest point of attack for, uh, from the erosion. Thanks to these models, we can formulate the best way to protect the site from this, its most imminent threats. As you can see already, uh, when, uh, when you created the model in the first, you can already see that the second layer is already pushing out of the surface. Uh, which already gives us some indication that something is going on there. And when, when you combine it with the 
um, current uh, hydrodynamic measurements, you can see that the biggest area of attack or the biggest area is right here. Seeing as we are still archaeologists and want to learn about the past, um, modeling only future erosion and protecting the sites would be rather unsatisfying. Therefore, numerous ways to reach insight to the past are utilized. More specifically, there have been a number of difficult problems related to in the interpolation of the cultural layers. So, uh, some of these problems were related to different aspects of taphonomy. Primarily, there were two aspects, the original paleotopography and the question of how exactly the organic material was preserved. If we can't explain what is preserved and what is lost, we can't quantifiably ev evaluate the excavated results. <coughs> to address these points, we took a first step um, towards modeling the geochemical diagenesis of the waterlogged organic deposits. To do so, we mainly use results uh, from the ecological literature on organic degradation. Second thing we did is uh, we involved a geotechnical expert to mod model the consolidation of the stratigraphy over the millennia, employing an iterative fin finite ele element model of the sediment compaction. These colleagues needed information on the course of the sediment buildup over the years. Uh, this is luckily for us, we actually uh, took in account this on the last big excavation, as you can see. These are the modern, uh, underneath is the, the prehistoric site, and on top is the modern archaeological buildup that we found. And through all these, uh, they were able to reconstruct uh, the topography in 3200 BC in the, on the site, and they were accurately able to. Also, this is what we have seen in the excavation, and they were um, they were able to <coughs> model how this was uh, this shift in the cultural in the layers happened. What next? A reason we are here is to get inspired from your ideas, especially with uh, yeah with the Bayesian models and everything. Uh, but even better, maybe, to, to somebody gives us ideas how to come up with a process-based model which would include all known variables and could uh, accurately predict the stratigraphical sequence we can see underwater today. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>